it's good to be back in the university of Manila. And I want to congratulate the law faculty for hosting this forum. I would say that a few years ago we would not have been allowed to do this, but there would have been serious impediments. So this is a welcome change. I thank uh, Agora for organizing this series of lectures. This is truly an important endeavor. I also want to acknowledge the presence of some of the other NGOs you will see now, Pastor Bastards, C4. And I hope that this will be the beginning of a collaboration between all these institutions to work to deal with the serious problem that we're going to discuss today. I was invited to give a keynote on the issue of corruption to launch this series of lectures that they're going to see over the coming month. And what I was asked to do and will do today is to give you a historical perspective. Why are we where we are today? Why are we having this problem of systemic corruption? I'm not just discussing corruption, I'm talking about systemic corruption. In other words, the widespread phenomenon that we're now confronted with. So let me get into this lecture. Please bear with me, it is a bit long. But I want to give you a history of what we are dealing with. First, the issue of the complexity of corruption. My problem with the with what's happening in Malaysia today is how we classify corruption. Corruption is now, to my mind, reduced to one thing, Raswa. You know, my Malay isn't very good, but my understanding of Raswa is bribery, bribes. We have an anti bribery campaign which is very strong. But I'd like to go beyond Raswa. I have expanded it. In fact, I'd like to go back to the period of 1997-1998 when we had the Asian financial crisis. And we had the crisis, the whole of the crisis in Malaysia and in Indonesia. At that time, the rallying cry was KKM. Corruption. Corruption. Corruption, collusion, collusion and nepotism. Collusion. Corruption, collusion and nepotism. It is ironic that even though we discussed this almost 30 years ago, and even though the phenomenon encapsulates these three terms, we are still focusing only on one issue, rights. That is my contention. We have to deal with the broader issues that inform the systemic corruption that we are confronted with. Which brings me to the next point. Why, why do we have the systemic corruption? We have public policies that have been in place which are patronage based, race based policies, patronage based policies. And the aim of these policies was basically to try and bring about reforms in the structure of society, to redistribute wealth more equitably, to ensure that the participation of ethnic groups, specifically the Bumikutras in the economy, is great. Redistribute wealth and create good good trial business. I have no problems with the NEP, the new economic policy. But I do have problems with its manner of implementation. I have no problems with many of the institutions that were created to bring about these social goals. I do have problems with the way in which these policies and these institutions have been captured by politicians to use it to serve their own interests. What were supposed to be institutions to help the poor is not happening. In fact, the poor are getting poorer, and I'm sure Dr. Kumar will speak on this too. While the politicians are getting rich beyond our imagination. Policies which were meant to help the poor are being hijacked by politicians to serve their own best interests. While this attempt to create entrepreneurs, nurture a, a community of business people who are active in the economy is not a problem. What we are seeing, in fact, is what we call crony capitalists. And if you look at the policies which have been post NEP, which have been created post NEP, ECIC, the Public Commercial Industrial Community, the SPV, the Shared Prosperity Vision, just introduced under Mohide. And now we have Jana Bimal at the heart of this corruption case that we are now confronted with. All these policies were created to nurture a group of dynamic businesses to help the SME sector in particular. The SME sector constitutes 98% of the corporate sector. 
98.5%. Of the 1.2 billion companies we have in this country, 98% of them are small and medium scale enterprises. And even among those firms, the great majority of them are micro firms. So there is value in these policies, but are these policies re reaching the target terms? Or have they been used or abused by politicians to further enrich themselves? So this then takes us back to the larger issue, malicious political economy. We can't just talk about politics or the economy. We've got to talk about the nexus between the two. And when we talk about this nexus between the two, the fundamental question that then arises is this. Where does power lie? And for this, again, we've got to go back in history. The defining moment would probably have to be Mahathir's administration, Mahathir's first administration. Cutting off the powers of the other arms of government and concentrating power in the office of the Prime Minister. The most powerful institution today is the cabinet. And that's why, as you can see, there's this struggle to become cabinet members, to become part of the executive. And why is this the struggle to become cabinet members? Because look at the volume of power that the cabinet has. First, they control all the key institutions, whether it's the MACC or the Securities Commission or the Bank of even the police, even the register of companies which decides on which parties can exist or cannot exist and which parties should, should not have elections for the president or the deputy president. It's all ultimately controlled by people sitting in cabinet. The register of societies cannot be under the control of the cabinet. What more, MECC, the AG. The second point, and I will speak at length on this issue because we have to talk about political control over the economy, the GLC system. The ministries control our huge GLC ecosystem. And I'll give you figures to show you exactly what it looks like. The third point, not only do they control the economy, they can control market entry. The cabinet ministers can decide on licenses that are to be issued. And as the recent corruption cases have indicated, the cabinet also decides on who gets contracts, procurement contracts. Who gets them? It's decided at the cabinet. What are then the key tools that the cabinet also controls to deal with this, to deal with this influence that they have over the economy? The first tool that they have on the GLIC is the government linked investment companies. And then they have the GLCs, the government linked companies. And they have foundations, they have statutory boards. You've got a whole slew of, of institutions under the control of the cabinet members which can then decide how they are to be deployed in the economy. These are important economic tools at hand that the politicians in cabinet have at hand. You should know of this. And if you know of this, and if you know then why it's Politicians are so eager to become members of the cabinet because not only of the political power that we have, but also of the economic influence that we have, then you begin to understand some of the political struggles that we seem to be, which is why we are also having this political mess that we're dealing with today. When you look at the literature, let me go back to the literature. I'm not going to go into an academic discussion, but we must be aware of the academic literature in terms of how we talk about corruption. The paradox that we have been seeing for many years in East Asia is why is it that we have countries like Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, where there's been phenomenal corruption, but there's also been extensive industrialization. It's a paradox. How do you explain that? How did these countries industrialize and become miracle economies as the World Bank calls them, and yet they are ridden with corruption? And meanwhile, we have other countries like the Philippines, Burma, or Myanmar, once touted by the World Bank as probably the most successful economies post growth in the post colonial period. Why have they become busted places? The reason for this is because we use the term developmental corruption and degenerative corruption. Developmental corruption means basically the government creates concessions, what we call it rents, where we pass these rents, these contracts, privatized projects into private hands and we expect these policy, these businessmen who have received these rents 
to use them productively. And they did it. If you look at Korea, Park Chung Hee, when he came to power, he issued contracts to key business people and told them, you must perform. If not, I'm taking back these contracts. And they performed. So today we have Samsung, we have Hyundai, major enterprises, global, global enterprises. Taiwan is a dynamic economy. Different kind of companies, as it is. And then we have Malaysia. We had something of that sort in Malaysia. This developmental corruption has been justified by people, and academics too, as it's all right. Developmental corruption is okay because after all you're getting an industrialized economy. So what's the complaint? The complaint became clear in 1997 when we had the Asian financial crisis. And this whole debate about developmental corruption went out of the window. Nobody talks about developmental corruption explicitly anymore. The other type of corruption that we see is what we call degenerative corruption. Here we give a concession to a politician or to a businessman, but they waste these resources. Markovs, for example, you saw all these rents and much of it is channeled abroad. The money does not remain in the economy. It's not circulating in the economy. It's taken out of the economy. So we see the rise of plutocracy. The first plutocracy in Asia, in Southeast Asia, was of course. In most countries, we see a combination of developmental and degenerative corruption. What we have seen now, the most recent, which is what we call excess money, to explain China's rise. Why is it China has all this corruption, but it's still now, it's now the most second largest economy. It's because we use the term excess money. Excess money is similar to developmental corruption. I'll give you a contract, but I expect you to. And then we have the other type of corruption, which they call uh, speed money. This is the other new lingo used, the new, new term, concept used in the discussion of corruption, speed money. And speed money refers to what we are very commonly think about, the bribes. We talk about theft, autocracy, petty and grand. So the, these are the terms that you all should know about to keep this in mind. So let's move on now. I have argued that it's time for us to go beyond, beyond the term Rusko. Let's look at other forms of corruption. And the other forms of corruption that come to mind include collusion, cronyism, nepotism. Now I'm not going to go and give you all a definition of each of these terms, but I will give you all a broad definition which encapsulates both of these terms. First, it is basically a secret agreement between or cooperation between two groups, politicians and business people. It's pretty good. And it can take different forms. But let's look at this now in history. In history, we have seen this collusion between politics and business, which goes back to the immediate to the immediate post-colonial period. MCA, for example, went into business, creating a welfare lottery in which they raised a lot of money. Amno went into business, and Amno controlled a lot of companies, including NSD, the three. Bank of Commerce now, now uh, part of the ENC Bank. So what you will see here is a phenomenon of political parties going into business. It still remains in place. Amno has divested most of its efforts, but MCA still remains a party that controls the stock. Huge source of revenue. This is important, sources of revenue. The trends began to change in the 1990s. In the 1990s, we had a new policy called privatization. The government's aim now was to privatize its extensive number of public enterprises, now called GLCs, to put them in private hands. And that was an important policy recommendation. And many people bought into this idea of the concept of privatization. The government is too big, so put it in private hands. What are the consequences of this, this privatization policy? I'll show you very soon. But the consequences of policy privatization was then exposed in the Asian financial crisis. What we also saw in the 1990s was of politicians now getting access, politicians also moving into business. Politicians becoming business. Politicians being privy to privatized companies. And we saw the consequences of that. So you can see different trends. And the third trend, after the Asian financial crisis, the renationalization of these companies, and so we see now the rise of GLCs. Now, 
let me make this simple by giving you evidence of what happened. To show you what happened. Let me give you some evidence also of public policies and of what I call policy capture. How they create policies that serve them to you. So I have two case studies. The first case study is about this first phenomenon, parties in business, and then the second phenomenon too, politicians in business. So here's a list. Today, as you know, there are a lot of people being called up, called up for corruption. One of them is, of course, most significantly is Dan's identity. This is based on the research which I did in the 1980s, 1990s. And here you can see the list. Now it's becoming clearer. Now you can understand what I'm trying to say by all these concepts. Yeah, now you're all sitting up to look at the list. This is it. This is what they were talking about, what happened during Mahathir's first term. Mahathir was the Prime Minister who was extremely interested in this. And he pushed policies to get business growing. He used the term, greed is good. He took up ideas from the West, from Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. Neoliberal ideas about privatization, creating a group of capitalists who would be the key drivers of growth. Much of Amdo's assets were then channeled into the hands of private business. Why? Because Mahathir had problems with business, with other politicians in Amdo. T A versus T B. Mahathir versus Mazali. You all remember that? Some of you are too young. 1987. T A versus T B. Everyone fighting over these assets. So what did we do? Put it in private hands. And who are these people who have this control over these vast assets that come no one's had? The people who control it are those most closely associated with Mahathir and Dan. And finance minister. So here's the list. At that time, one of the most powerful business politicians were Mahathir, Dan, and Anwar. At that time, you're either pro Mahathir or pro Anwar. I don't know whether you remember what it is. Prime Minister and Finance Minister, two most powerful people in the country. So if you look at this list, Halim Saad, these are names which may not be familiar to you, but I brought it up here because it's going to come up. Halim Saad, Tajuddin Ramli, Wan Azmi, these are names which uh, are key people who basically were trustees for Amdo. They also benefited from privatization. The privatization of Mars was not to benefit Tachuru Ramli. Cellcom went to Tachuru Ramli. Privatizing major projects, or major institutions belonging to the government and putting them in the hands of businessmen linked directly to politicians. And most of these people were groomed by times and Now this speaks to the issue of how did these people get wealthy, so wealthy? And here you begin to see some of the trends that were put in place to allow politicians or businessmen linked to them to become wealthy. I've just listed some of them. And I've listed them because, as I said, these are people who are now going to be discussed as we went into the cases of corruption that began to occur in the, that began in the 1990s. But here's another list. Same, all taken from my book, Polit uh, Political Discussion. So please get the book and read it. I'm only giving you a small segment of the list of people. This is only two pages. The book has got about six pages. That's how extensive the list was. And here you can see some familiar names again. Tunku Atnan, recently arrested for corruption, got exonerated. And I'll tell you all why later. Kamarudi Mohan Noor, some shooting Kade, and now look, his two sons, Sapura, Mahate's three sons. Mirza, Mokris, and Mirza. Look at the companies that they control. So here you're beginning to see now why the issue of nepotism was raised. Here you're beginning to understand why the issue of pollution was raised. Why aren't we problematizing and discussing this? Where are the academics from the School of Business and Economics who are supposed to deal with this? And what about the law faculty who are still having a discussion about the scope of the law that it encapsulates these terms. And you can see further down other people's name come, uh, coming out which are very familiar with. Ahmad Zahid Amiri, his famous company, he himself said, I became rich because of this company, Karatan Holdings, by his own admission. At that time, an Anwar confidant, as you can see here. I'm not putting these words here, I'm just taking these things from my book and putting it here. No change. I've just reduced some of the comments. But basically what I'm trying to show you was 
if you want to understand what is happening in politics today, you must also understand the relationships that were that had been forged in the 1990s. And the other businessmen, Vincent Tan, under that vision, and they will come up again soon. This businessman's name will come up. So this is my first case study, which I want to put it up for you. Now this, re the reason why I put this up is to discuss this in the context of a public policy, privatization. Privatization is a major public policy which could hijack our politicians to serve their best interests. Just like the Bumiputra policy, hijacked by politicians, meant for poor Bumiputras, but hijacked by politicians to serve their interests. Policy capture, policy abuse. Let's go to the second case study. This is more recent. And here I want to acknowledge the work of C4. C4 has been doing a lot of important work of late, which unfortunately does not get right. Why is it that the world, that such work, scandals like this, don't get better? Because, and here is my key point, it's getting more complex. Now the PFI scandal is the public, or the private financial initiative, private finance initiative, similar to privatization. You give out contracts, but the private sector funds it. But that's not what happened. They call it PFI, private finance initiative. They're supposed to pay for it and then leave it on its, on its bill to give it back to the government. But that's not what happened. They call it PFR, but instead what is created is a policy which permits the government to give out contracts on preferential terms to what we call or list as cronies, the well connected. And how do they fund it? They take the money from the EPF. What? The GLICs. And they use money from EPF and Quark, pension funds to give contracts to well-connected businessmen. Now why is this so complex? Because it also involves collateral land. This is important. Land. Land is an important resource. When we look at the earlier list, when we look at this list, how did these people become rich? Equity, stocks, shares. When you come to this scandal, it's about land, and how land is being abused. So here's a diagram that shows you how it's done. And look at how complex we have. We have on one hand a law, a law pertaining to a statutory body, the Federal Lands Commissioner. The Federal Lands Commissioner was a body created in the colonial period, just before independence, to allow the government to own the multitude of land, parcels in this country owned by the government. Very few people know about the Federal Lands Commission. Very few people know about the volume of land owned by the government. But many people know that land is a major resource given out by the government to the well-connected to allow them to get rich quick. We all talk about it. How did all these people get rich so quickly? Not equity. Land. And who controls the land? The government. But how many of you know of the Federal Lands Commission? How many of you are aware of how the land belonging to the government was used as collateral to give to EPF so that EPF and KMOC can give out 30 billion ringgit, which was then given to these people? You can't see the list, don't, don't worry about reading the list. But what is important is the report is there. Read the report. Again, I'm only giving you a segment of the report. But this list, if you could read it, is very important because among the names listed here are people like the family of Sushurin Kadi, was in the first list, Sai Mokta, now in the news, MCAs, companies, politicians linked to the MCA, and politicians linked to them. So if you look at this diagram, and if you look at this diagram, the first thing you realize is in the 1990s it was very simple. The contracts are visible. You can see who gets the product as contracts, and you can see how they're employing them. But when it comes to this, now we are well into the 2020s, we have a similar public policy, somewhat related to privatization, but using this model, where it becomes very complex, and convoluted, and so difficult to understand. I remember one of the politicians who exposed this in Parliament, uh, he was called up by NECC to explain this, and later, in a forum that he had, he 
expressed, he pointed out that even the MACC officials couldn't understand this complex scam. And that's why you all hear so little, but it is a major scandal. Which brings me now to the next point. This is why I'm saying we have to go beyond just talking about crimes. We've got to look at the system. We've got to look at the structure of the state that has been created. And what are the key features here? Policies. You've got to look at the policies. What were the policies conceived for and how are the policies being used? They're two different things. The rhetoric of the policies and the reality of how they are deployed employed, utilized. And this is why policies deserve no attention. When we talk about policies, are these policies being implemented the way they do it? I've just given you two policies. To make these things work, you must control the banks, the GLC banks. Now it's worse. You must control the GLIC. Because the GLICs, like EPF, K1, are flush with money. The system won't work unless the politicians don't have control over the financial resources of the city. If in the past they used the banks to give out the loans, now they're using another mechanism. Are we aware of the abuse of the EPF? We had a discussion with EPF and we were writing this report. And we were very worried about this report coming out. I must say they must be very relieved that nothing much came out of this report in the sense it was not taken up, exposing how important institutions can be abused. So what are the lessons we can learn from these, just these two, these two policies? Post-Asian financial crisis, post-1997. First, the renationalization of privatized companies. We prefer to use the word bailouts. You know of all the bailouts that occur. And when the bailouts occur, bailouts of Tajudin, bailout of Allen, bailout of Merzan, when the bailouts occur, then we saw these companies coming back into the hands of the state. And then we see the rise of the GLCs. The GLCs then become a major economic tool back in the hands, directly in the hands of politicians, not in the hands of private businessmen who are well connected back in the hands of politicians themselves. Politicians now have enormous control over very important companies. The question then arises, what are they going to do about this? In 1997, because of the scale of the crisis, they had reforms, what we call corporate governance reforms. The reforms were about what's happening within the companies. The OECD said the reforms introduced in Malaysia were among the best in the world. So if the OECD is saying that the corporate governance reforms introduced in Malaysia post-financial crisis were among the best in the world, why are we still having corruption on a greater scale? Because the reforms that occurred did not include reforms of public institutions. The reforms did not include the delinking of politicians from the corporate sector. So yes, we have a corporate governance system that is supposed to be very good. It's supposed to be because I really don't think it's that good looking at the scandals that we still have. But that was what was important even by the OECD at the time. So when we had the opportunity to bring about institutional reforms post-financial crisis, we didn't do it. In fact, the hand of the state strengthened. post Mahathir, when Abdullah came to power, I don't know whether you all remember Abdullah's time, most of you are very young. When Abdullah came to power, he talked about eradicating corruption. He talked about reforming the GLCs. He had many books, many colored books, to deal, he had a 10 year plan to deal with the reform of the GLCs. But his focus was only on the GLICs and listed companies. When Najib came to power, he talked about the same thing. When Najib came to power, remember it was at the time of the global financial crisis. The economy was in deep recession. When Najib took power in 2009, a year after the global financial crisis, he talked about reforms. He talked about policies such as the Bumi Putra policy. He, in fact, openly said, no more affirmative action. He said, I'm going to eradicate corruption. I really that he should say it, but he said it. And what happened? 
he backtracked. He backtracked on the policy. He retained it. He called it market-friendly affirmative action. It's an oxymoron. It isn't there. That's what he called it. The second thing he backtracked on, he said, I'm going to push for privatization. The government is too big. One year later, he stopped talking about privatization. Why? Because he realized he was sitting on a gold mine. And for a corrupt politician to suddenly realize he's sitting on a gold mine, the last thing he wants to do is to give away the gold or give away control of that gold. And then we have Mugiri. I left out Pakata, Mahate, and he came to power, second term, the Pakata and Pakata. Mahathir was a great critic of the GLC system. He called it a monster. He should know. He created it. Yes, he created it. He should know. He called it a monster when he was in opposition. When he came to power, suddenly he went silent on it. Why? Because he was well aware that his GLC system would help him and his party gain access to the rural Malay, Heartland, Vesatu, and Nusa. Or if at all ends, very little so. Clearly, no support in Kelantan. Then Mohidin comes to power, and at that time, we were having the COVID pandemic, which led to an economic crisis. And he said, too, we must reform the GLCs because the GLCs are now the drivers of the economy. The private sector is now in lockdown. The only institution that can save the economy are the GLCs. And so the GLCs came to the fore, rightly so. So you can see that now they're cutting down on the cost for consumption of electricity supply. The telecommunication company cutting down on the cost for use of telecommunications. The banks giving out monetary home loans, the GLC banks. Excellent. It showed you the importance of GLCs and the important role of GLCs, especially in a time of crisis. GLCs are not something that we just go and privatize. GLCs play an important role in social welfare. GLCs play a social role in economic redistribution. GLCs can also play an important role, as I said, when we are confronted with a pandemic. So he came up with a plan called Pakuko. Six billion ringgit given for the Pakuko plan to revamp the GLC system. I don't know what happened to that six billion. Nobody talks about the Pakuko. Now, with the recent crisis, the recent public policy called Jana Viva, Vibawa, Vibawa, where a lot of money was channeled there, I'm wondering whether the same thing happened with the Kuku. Again, another public policy introduced by the government to bring about reforms, but we don't know what the money is. And the reforms never happened. And in fact, the GLCs were used to serve another purpose. Politicians were appointed to head the GLCs. If you couldn't get in that into the cabinet, you give them a GLC appointment. Only in its own words. So here you're seeing uh, the rhetoric of reforms, including of the GLCs, but the reality of being that politicians have no political will to do this. So what we are seeing here now, today, if you look at point C, we have an extremely complex system that has been created. The government's like because the government is highly interventionist. There's a lot of criticisms of that. They like to espouse neoliberal privatization type policies, but at the same time, they don't do it. They abuse public funds. Second, you see the link now between policies, legislations, and the GLCs. A system has been created linking the three. This system is very important because it reinforces, expands the patronage system. If before only a small group of people were benefiting from privatization, now it's huge. It reaches down to the grassroots. Abdullah saw this. Abdullah recognized that hey, the SMEs are a big, big segment of the corporate sector. Why are we focusing only on a small group of people? If we give the rents to a large group of companies, then we get more support. That was the plan. Now this is what we're seeing occurring. So see the tactics used by the system that has been created. And finally, the last point. Look at how we abuse the government's resources. Money, I mentioned the EF, paywall and others. Land. Land. Land is an issue we have to take very seriously post-pandemic, especially now with the food security problem. 
late last year, I visited a few states with some of my colleagues from the Econ's faculty. We went to the poorer states, Saha, Klamtan, Trungani. We went to see land programs, agricultural programs, to see what was the problem. Why are we having a food security problem? And that's where we saw how land was abused. Land which should be put in the hands of farmers as means to enhance agricultural production was not reaching. In fact, we've taken away by politicians to serve their own interests. So these are important issues uh, that we need to think about when we talk about corruption, how policies are being abused. Which brings me now to the system. Let's talk more about the system, how the system works. What are the tools available for the system? Najib, when he came to power, he talked about eradicating corruption. But then he realized that there is this complex system that was in place, which he could then use to serve his political and business interests, his political and personal interests. So institutions like Felda, Mara, 1MDB, I've named these three because all three were mired in corruption. Serious corruption. Falda and Mara are institutions created to help the poor. It is not the poor who benefit. In fact, these institutions were the center of major corruption business. Another, another institution I should mention, I did it, Tabo Panji. Another institution created to help the poor. But not the poor in the manner in which it really helped them. The second point, competitive politics. Now, remember, when did magic come to power? 2008. In 2008, that is the real epochal election in Malaysian history. That is the first time Bangsa National lost its two-thirds majority. Abdullah couldn't believe it that he had lost the two-thirds majority when he had done so well in the previous election in 2004. And in that election, for the first time, five state governments fell. And these five state governments fell to the opposition, Akatan parties, DAP, PKR, were now in control of important state governments. Two of the most industrialized states in the country were controlled by DAP and PKR. These parties were in the forefront just a year earlier with Bursley talking about the need to stand out corruption the need to end money politics. 2009, when we talked about introducing a political financing act to introduce mechanisms to curb money politics, stamp out corruption, members of these parties too, along with members from UNO, said no. They won't do it. See how you change when you get power. I want you all to know this because we have a crisis today in the hands. There is no political will from any party to bring about real change. Any political party in power will be qualified. That. That's my <laughs> life. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm glad you clapped with yes, sir, because they have been steadfast in talking. No other political party has stood up and said this. Can you now in power bring about the change that is required? And I'll show you very soon with some diagrams what is happening to explain this. Why he said no. The third issue which I want you all to know about, which is very important, is about business people returning to politics. The phenomenon of politicians in the 1950s, 1960s. How case, business how case, formed a party called the MCA, joined the alliance, and they funded all of this. We are seeing a return of this phenomenon, businessmen entering into the political system. I've been told to speak closer to the mic. <laughs> So what is my concern? Sorry, I got distracted. What is my concern? 
My concern today is when we charge politicians for corruption, we charge them for bribes, taking bribes. And when they take the bribes, what is their defense? It's not a bribe. These people gave me a political donation. And so you can see politicians, clearly wealthy beyond imagination, suddenly being exonerated in a court of law. Why? There is no law on this matter. A political financing act, which we were voting for and calling for since 2009, now we are well into the 2020s, has still not come. And you're seeing the repercussions of the procrastination of politicians on not acting on this matter going back to 2009. Now you're seeing the consequences of that. One major consequence of that is, of course, one MDP. Now, what are the other institutions, the new research that is coming up, that is indicating how these politicians are having access to public resources? Foundations. Foundations are being created by politicians as a mechanism to collect donations. The Registrar of Societies, which is responsible for political parties, is also responsible for many of these foundations. You see the power of the Registrar of Societies. The GLCs. Nobody wants to relinquish control of the GLCs. So the key trend here, what we are seeing now, is a link between public, public institutions, political institutions, and private enterprises, all controlled ultimately by powerful politicians. No distinction. So let me show you this in tangible terms, so you can see. The link of the tree. Foundations linked with magic. Again, work done by C4, which got little attention. Foundations are at the center of many of the corruption issues that we are talking about. In this case, you can see the list of foundations are government-linked foundations, public, family-linked foundations, private, public and private, working together to serve Western interests and linked to ultimately the one MDB scale. So let me put it to you this way to show you how all this works. And this is just magic. Najib has control over the Noah Foundation, the Family Foundation, Yaya San Raha. As you can see, he also has control over the Ministry of Finance, which is directly linked to 1MDB, which also has its own Yaya San. Yaya San 1MDB. Can you see the link? Can you see the number of foundations? And all of them at the heart of this transfer of wealth of money from a GLC created by Najib, 1MDB. The linking of the public, the private, and the person. Fortunately, this was exposed. And look at the donors. Major enterprises. One, a private firm, didn't think. Another, another GLC. Patronize. The sources of funds for the politicians are huge. Not just from the GLCs, but also from major enterprises, which get access to government contracts too, for such donations. Let me show you another one. Zahir now charged for corruption, just like Najib. And look at Naj uh, Zahir. Again, you can see the similar thing. Foundations, government foundations, party foundation, private foundations, all linked, all ultimately controlled by Zahir in one way or the other. Here's a better way of looking at it and how they mix it all together. This diagram captures how Zahir, Minister of Home Affairs, has access to contracts which are given out for which he gets donations. The donations go into a Yayasa controlled directly by him, a family owned Yayasa, for which he was charged. Everything I'm showing you here today is from court testimony. All this was revealed in court. So now you know why foundations are very important. Recently, uh, Mugidin was charged for corruption and there was some discussion about a foundation, a private foundation that he owns. How many people are aware of the use of foundations to serve Western interests? How many people are aware that the foundations are the conduit through which private businessmen channel funds into the foundation, which is then channeled into the political system, further monetizing the political system, leading to the scale of corruption that we are seeing today? It is these institutions that need to be reformed, that we need to look into, but nobody, nobody is discussing it. Why? Because politicians, many politicians have control of foundations. Many politicians, when they become politicians, set up 
a foundation. The foundation becomes the mechanism through which they can get these donations, which flow then into their political activities. And there's no scrutiny of these foundations. And if there's no scrutiny of, scrutiny of these foundations, how are you to know what is happening? So this is one aspect of the system that I'm talking about, which of which there's little knowledge of. Which brings me now to the second institution, the second tool, the GLCs. The GLCs are not just government -led companies, they're two types. The GLICs, and these are the seven GLICs. Whenever government talks about reforms, these are the seven GLICs they talk about. Minister of Finance Incorporated, Kazana, the Sovereign Wealth Fund, EPF, you know, KWO, the Pension Fund for Civil Servants, the Lebaga Tabong the Pension Fund for People in the Armed Forces, Tabung Haji, PNP. They talk about these seven. The fact of the matter is, they call them GLICs, but they do different things. Minister of Finance Incorporated is a holding company. It doesn't even have a board of directors. It's a holding company directly controlled by the Minister of Finance who has enormous control over the large number of companies controlled by MOF. Then we have Kazana. Kazana is a sovereign wealth fund. It is very different from PNB, which is an investment fund for which PNB and ETF, they collect on a monthly basis cash from the public and they are huge investment bodies which they invest in investment funds or in other, in other areas, in equity or in other areas. Completely different from Kazana and MOF. And then we have Tabung Haji and Lebaga LTAT, Tabung Haji and LTAT. Tabung Haji and LTAT are business groups. They own a huge range of companies. They are conglomerates in their own right. So when we talk about reforms of the GLICs, what exactly are we talking about? When they're all different types of institutions. And that's why we don't see any real reform going on with regards even to the GLICs. Because they all have to be handled separately. I know for a fact that there was a discussion about this during the Pakatan's first administration of the Mahat. But no change came about from this. Which brings me to what do these seven control? And this comes to this. Ministries in business. Do you know that the ministries control GLCs? And I'm talking here about the big four. The big four are the Prime Minister's Department, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Rural Development. This is 2018 figures, 2017 figures, 2018 figures. And mostly, mostly science and technology, not very important. Big, but not very important. Usually the mostly minister is not an important minister. But let me ask you all today, who is the Prime Minister in control of the Prime Minister's Department? Yeah. Anwar Ibrahim. Who is the Minister of Finance? Anwar Ibrahim. And now you know why it was important to make, this is why prior to 2018 there was talk, the Finance Minister cannot be the Prime Minister, Najib cannot do that, Abdullah cannot do that. Pakatan, first Pakatan government made the deal later. Why are we going back to this? Some clue to that is provided here. And who is the Minister of Rural Development? Zahid. Zahid. You get the point? I've shown this before to the previous governments, asking them to stop this. They didn't do it. The current government seems to be doing the same thing. Why? Because the volume of resources controlled by just these three ministries are huge. It's huge. Ministry of Rural Development, do you know that the Ministry of Rural Development is a very important ministry created by Tun Raza? Tun Raza created the Ministry of Rural Development because his objective was he was to be the Prime Minister for Rural Development. His focus was on the poor in rural areas. So he created the Ministry of Rural Development and created a whole body of statutory body, bodies, a whole slew of statutory bodies, Kajora, Kataga and so on, go down to the ground to help the poor. And they went down to the ground and so their influence in the rural areas is huge. These are the institutions that have their roots right into the Malay heartland areas. Whoever controls the Ministry of Rural Development has access 
to the poorest communities in this country, including in the Malay affluent states. And that is why, if you go back and look at history, the Minister of Rural Development was always a senior unknown member. You get the point. This is the system that I'm talking about. This is the structure that was created to serve a political purpose. But they also have enormous access to funds. So it's not just about reaching out to rural constituencies where if you capture the rural constituencies, you can form the government. It's also about with all these GLCs, all those in purple are GLCs, you can give directorships to your party members. And these party members get a salary, a stipend. So if I am a minister and I have my supporters who help me become minister, I give them jobs as directors of GLCs for which they get a nice salary, some of it which will go into the financing of political activities. An enormous source of revenue for politicians. And that's why when Bohidin came to power, when he formed one of the largest cabinets we've ever seen in Malaysian history, since he couldn't accommodate everybody, he told the others, never mind, don't worry, I'll make you GLC directors, which he then promptly did. Now you know why. And the people who became directors of prominent GLCs were specifically also those in the Ministry of Rural Development. It's, a politic, it's an economic tool. But look at this figure, and this is what I wanted to talk about. Where are the other parties? I've shown this before in my other talks. I want to refresh your memory. GLCs at the federal level, I just showed you. This is GLCs at the state level. Just as we have GLCs in the federal government, every state has a GLC system. Every state. After the 2008, after the 2018 general election, after the 2018 general election, of the 13 states that we had, eight different parties had control of the 13 state governments. Eight different parties had control over a GLC system like this. So this is just Salango. Look at Salango, you can see they also have, like we have MOF Inc., they have MBR, Monkey Beside Corporate. Same like MOF. They control a lot of companies. And sitting there, as you can see the names of politicians, this is a 2017 figure. This is a not current, it's history. You can see politicians being appointed as directors of companies. This is PKR. This is DAP, same thing. <coughs> DAP is interesting because DAP created, interestingly enough, Chief Minister Incorporated. It was DAP who created Chief Minister Incorporated. <coughs> same thing happening. Us. Same thing. And we go to Johor, I'm not, I didn't put it up here because you get the point. You get the point. Every state has it, and in parties control, different parties are controlling the states. Why change the system? No political will to do it. Because all of them have a system, some may not have federal control, but at least they have state control, where they can use the similar system to serve their political interests, including their economic interests, including to serve as mechanisms of patronage to the constituencies that matter to them. Past is very interesting because past, when we looked at past, we were shocked. The volume of politicians sitting as directors in each of these GLCs. A huge waste of resources. A study is now being done, I heard, of Sarawak. Most studies have been done on Sarawak and Sarawak. I'd like to see the, the study, it's not been done by me. I heard the World Bank is doing something on Sarawak, the ideas. I'd like to see the outcome in the study of Sarawak. Sabah wanted to do something under Warisan. I remember I was called for a discussion here. I went for a forum there when we talked about this. It was talk about reforming Sabah's GLCs, which are mine in corruption, but nothing ever happened of that. So there's all this discussion, especially when you come to power. But when the time comes to do it, to doing it, they don't do it. Now you know. What are we going to do when all politicians are privy to a system 
which can be a great benefit for their political interests, economic interests, to gain power. It comes back to this, civil society. And the last point here, the last mechanism, I want to come back to this because this is our most recent study, again by C4, business in politics. This came out just before the last general election. Again, it didn't get the traction I felt it now. The reason for this report was we wanted to show that different ways in which politicians are entering into the political system, oh, sorry, the different ways in which businessmen are entering into the political system. It's taking around form which is becoming quite worrisome. So the first start we have politicians and family businesses. We have people like, for example, Larry Sim. Larry Sim, you remember, set up a party from Sarawak. Fadila Yusuf, current deputy, deputy prime minister. They have family businesses, and these family businesses have access to a lot of resources, specifically in Sarawak. Then we have children of former leaders. Hanifa Thai. You all know Hanifa Thai? Thai Mahmoud's daughter. Currently, a deputy minister, minister of economic Minister in the economic. And the Rafiz is okay. And the Prime Minister's department. Yamani is Musa, former Chief Minister of Sabah, Musa, his son. Then we have businessmen in politics. Hamza Zainuddin, opposition leader. Said Abu Hussein, current MP for Bukit Gantan. Tiong King Singh, current minister. All were businessmen, businessmen who went into politics. So now you're beginning to see businessmen entering the political process. This is where we talk about the phenomenon of state capture. You get the point? Join the system, get access to the rights. Then we also have a phenomenon of professionals, uh, William Young, Tunku Zafru. I'm mentioning all these names because when we were looking at this, we were looking at politicians who were involved or who were named in the Pandora Papers. Today there's a discussion about the Pandora Papers, right? Those who are named in the Pandora Papers are going to be called up. Okay, let's see who's going to be called up. And it's interesting that some of these people I mentioned are still, are now part of the current government. So what we are seeing here in this diagram, as I put at the bottom, is a complex mix of politicians, business people, and bureaucrats. I haven't mentioned much about bureaucrats, but at the PFI scandal, at the heart of it is Bureaucrats. I probably Malaki will be talking about that, the role of bureaucrats in this whole system. But here's a diagram, the next generation. A diagram of here I'm looking specifically at Hanifa Khan. I'm not looking at a father. Tai Mahmoud who was listed as one of the most corrupt politicians in this country. I'm looking at the second generation. And they too have their own business interests. But I also want to point out the role of a company called LCDA, the Land Holdings Company of Sarawak. Again, important to have a bureaucrat in control of a GLC or an institution that has control over land because most of the issues that we're talking about involving corruption are land related matters. Here's a diagram of Larry Sim, second generation, in fact, third generation. It's far more complex third generation, really into business. Businessmen who have also become part of the political process. Are we seeing a new phenomenon of businessmen now entering the political system? Yes, we are. And we have to be careful about this. Because once businessmen come into the system, they also have a, I'm not saying they can't. I'm not saying they shouldn't. But I am saying that we got to be careful about it. Because this can also lead to the monetization serious monetization of politics. And once you have control of the state, you can then conceive public policies to serve your business interests. Remember I made the point about policies and how policies serve the interest of those in power and not the people they were meant to serve? Well, we were aware of this too. So this brings me to my conclusion. Why is corruption so serious? We are only dealing with bribes. Good. It's important. Please carry on. But we are not dealing with the system, the structure that was created 
which will continue to perpetuate. And I gave you some examples, even in the current government. Even the current government is not showing that will to break the system. And this is something we've got to speak up and let the government know. I have a faith in this government, Manwar, that they, there are a lot of good people in government today. This is our chance now to bring about the change, but we've got to put the pressure on them to do it. Because this government also comprises people who have mentioned in the slides. So the more pressure we put on them, the better it is for us to deal effectively with this issue of systemic corruption. And here, as I said, it takes many forms. Patronage, collusion, cronyism, plutocracy, embezzlement, money laundering. All these things are happening today. The situation is dire. All these things are happening simultaneously. But there has been no real, it's been piecemeal in the way in which they've been going about this. And I do worry about the big problem of still very powerful executive who controls key institutions such as the MECC, the Attorney General's Office, the SC. Is that a reason why they have been so piecemeal in the way they've been acting on this phenomenon? Is that the reason why we don't have the requisite legislation in place to deal with these new trends that are emerging? Is this why we are so backward? Why is the law so far behind the trends that we see in the economy today? And what of new public policies? New public policies will emerge soon. Please pay attention to these policies. How, whose, whose interests do they serve? Now, I'm not going to go into a long discussion on the key reforms. We have had tons of it. I've listed them down here. I've listed them here just to remind you. I'm not going to even discuss it because we've discussed this in multiple reports. In fact, we're tired of it. How many times must we discuss this before the politicians act? So I close with this point. I have not seen the political will to bring about the change so far. It must be fair. It's a new government. But I feel it's incumbent upon us to keep the pressure on this government up so that we, we are aware, we are watching, and we want these reforms implemented. Otherwise, the corruption system that we have now, the Systemic corruption that we have now in this country will not be in the public. Thank you.